Hello, everybody. I'm sorry I do not speak Malayalam, so bear with me, I'll be speaking in English. First of all, I would like to thank Kerilium for this invitation to be with you all today as we gather together to remember Biju Balan. A question that plagues all of us is how should we live? From whatever little I have got to know about Biju, his was an inspiring life and there is much that he did and said that can help us to have a meaningful conversation with our own lives. Biju's ideals and aspirations continue to live on through individuals and collective efforts throughout the country, all those who are for truth and justice. As we know, our country today is facing a terrible crisis, a crisis where democracy is being subverted. Inside out, it reminds me of this disease or illness that my mother suffered from, which was called SLE, that is systemic lupus, and the E is a long word, so I forget what it was, erythipin something, but SLE, lupus it was called. Now what it was, was a problem of the autoimmune system, where the immune system stops functioning the way it should function in the body and the antibodies you know that are supposed to protect you they start attacking you know organs in your own body SLE can only be contained it cannot be cured when this happens it often means a slow journey towards death is this what is happening to democracy in India? I should like to examine this question by sharing with you some crucial aspects of the story of Bastar as it exists today. For those of, who, of you who, for whom you know, Bastar may be a little new, let me just very quickly tell you a little bit about the region, the people, uh, the politics. So Bastar is today the southernmost region of the state of Chhattisgarh, which was formed in 2000 when it was bifurcated from Madhya Pradesh. When it was in Madhya Pradesh, it was the largest district of the country. Today, the Bastar subdivision is divided into seven districts. What is important to note about Bastar is that it has a very high percentage of Adivasis. Like in Chhattisgarh, you have Adivasis in the south and you have Adivasis in the north. In between, in the plains area, you have mostly non-tribals. So, this area is almost 100% in, you know, it's in the fifth schedule of the country, which as you know, you know, gives special protection to the Adivasis. There are five major tribes of which Gond are the, you know, biggest tribe. Besides it being, you know, Adivasi land, it is a hilly region, heavy forest, two-thirds of it is forest, and it is said that after Assam, this is the most forested region of the country. And it is very rich in natural resources, most notably minerals. So actually, what is happening in Bastar today is the same old story that has happened in many other parts of the world, you know, where it deals with the whole question of mining and the indigenous populations. So the same story in some ways we can see is playing out in Bhaktar. 
Besides the tribals, there is a good number of non-tribals now in Bastar who have a history of 200 years. Bastar used to be a princely state and that time the Raja had come from Varangal, now in Telangana. And when he came later for his kingdom, you know, he invited people to do his accounts. Some people came from near the neighboring Odisha, some people came from Andhra. So like that, you know, for many years now, you have these non-tribals there. There has also been migration in recent times of non-tribals. And many of these non-tribals also are, you know, Bastariya, like Bastar people or local people of Bastar, living ordinary lives. But some of them are also the, you know, the, those who are the contractors, the traders, those who have, a, you know, closer links with the administration. So, these, this section of the population has played a very important role and a very, in some ways, uh, devious kind of a role in the present, you know, war that has been going on in Bastar. In terms of the politics in the region, it is important to note that there are mainly two big political parties, the BJP and the Congress. So even though the BJP has been winning, Congress has not been winning as many seats, but in terms of votes polled, it is roughly the same. So Congress is also sort of there, but in terms of a hold on the population, like BJP has, uh, you know, increasingly in the last two elections, we have seen BJP has a greater hold, and increasingly you can see a spread of Hindutva politics, Hindutva organizations, uh, you know, saffronization uh, in Chhattisgarh as a whole, but especially in the Adivasi belt. So, as far as electoral politics is concerned, we understand that in a democracy, in a multi-party system, the whole idea is that we should have more parties so that they check each other. But what happens if there are two main parties and they start thinking alike? So this is what happened in Chhattisgarh, as far as the economic policy is concerned, as far as the counter-insurgency measures that the state adopted are concerned. So when Salva Judum started this big op counter-insurgency operation, the leader of Salva Judum was a congressman who was the leader in the assembly. You know, he was the leader of opposition in the assembly and he was the leader of the, you know, uh, Salva Judum, which we will talk about soon. There are other, besides the Congress and the BJP, there are other smaller parties, like there is the CPI, there is the BSP. Once upon a time, CPI had a stronghold on entire Bastar. But it, you know, there you, you also used to be a few MLAs, but now that is not the case. And other parties are too small. So this year is an election year in Chhattisgarh. Assembly elections 2019 is again election years and you know it would seem that you know BGP is going to come back to power again you know and that has been the case for the last few elections. In terms of people's politics you know I would like to mention that as I mentioned earlier that CPI has been here in Bastar since the 1950s. It used to be strong, but in the 1980s, the PWG came. First, it crossed Kamam, it came into Bastar, and it was using Bastar as a shelter zone. PWG, as you know, is the People's War Group, uh, you know, a Naxalite party. And uh, that time, the, in the 80s, they were very strong in the now Telangana region, and there was severe police repression. So, for shelter, they used to come to Bastar. And slowly as they made inroads into Bastar, they saw the situation of the tribals. 
and you know that increasingly that became their base. As their politics spread to tribal areas of neighboring Gadchiroli district of Maharashtra, of Balagat region of Madhya Pradesh, of neighboring districts of Odisha, and so on, this entire region became what is called Dandakaranya. And their headquarters became this place called Abujmar in Narayanpur district of uh, Bastar. So that is another reason that this whole you know, focus of the Indian state on Bastar today is because you know, it is the headquarter of the, th this party uh, which initially was a single party but later it merged with other, two other Naxalite groups uh, in 2004, 98 and then in 2004 and became the CPI Maoist. And it became the single largest party, Naxalite party, uh, you know, in the country. Now here again I would like to mention, though perhaps this is understood here, but often in Bastar this is not understood. They often think of the CPI Maoist as the Naxalite party. But you know, actually as we know, there are many Naxalite groups in the country. Some of them are also, you know, contesting elections. Uh, some of them have a combination of underground politics and overground, you know, uh, politics. So there are many, more than 40 Naxalite groups, of which the most militarized, you know, with the PLGA, People's Liberation Guerrilla Army, etc., is the present-day CPI Maoist. Now it's interesting that to note that the mergers. The CPI Moist was formed in 2004. Around the same time, the Indian state started calling it as the, as the greatest internal security threat. So what happened? So in terms of timing, well, you know, what we see is this, that you know, as we know, our economy you know, liberalized, this whole phase of globalization started in the 90s. By the time, you know, you saw uh, evidence of that on the ground, it was in the 2000s. And around that time, actually, MOUs, you know, M M Memorandum of Understanding, all these things started being signed with, you know, multinational uh, corporations without any information to the Adivasi people. So this was happening in Bastar area, it was happening in Ch Chhattisgarh, other parts of Chhattisgarh, in Odisha, in Jharkhand. So across the tribal track in some ways, uh, Gatchiroli again there is a lot of mining going on there also. You know this, this started happening. So in, and in each of these places you see that the laws that are in place, that PESA is a very important law, Panchayat Extension to the Schedule Areas Act 1996, which you know allows the people to have a Gram Sabha and to be able to say no. So PESA was circumvented. Other you know important acts like the Forest Rights Act 2006 is circumvented. So you know other things like environmental clearances. So all the due process that according to law the government should follow. The, you find that the government in project after project is, you know, not following the rule of law and it's basically working in the interest of the corporates. So you could see that very clearly on the ground. So in Bastar, in a place like Lohandi Guda, for example, which is just 20 kilometers from Jagdalpur, Tata Steel Company was trying to take 10,000 hectares of land of 10 panchayats. The CPI led a 10 year or long struggle which involved a lot of repression of all kinds including being labelled as Maoists and being put behind bars etc. And finally the Tata Steel had to go. So again in Lohanti Guda we saw very clearly how during Pesa, you know, Sabhas, they would actually bring the police, you know, police would be there in large contingent when the Pesa Gram Sabha is happening. The minutes of the meeting are kept in the collector's office and so on. So basically the point here is that in terms of the timing, you can see, you can see that there is a larger agenda at play. Around this time, SR company also comes into Bastar, 2005. 2005 is the time 
that the state unleashes a very severe counter insurgency against the Maoists. So initially they said that this is a spontaneous movement of the Adivasi people of this region against the Maoists. So this was called the Salwa Judum, which is Gondi word, which means Salwa means purification and Judum means hunt. So when they go for Shikar or hunt, that is Judum. So it is like, you know, you are purifying the area of the Maoists. So like that. So it's called Salwa Judum. So initially they made this Salwa Judum as something that was a uh, you know, uh, people's movement. But soon we could see on the ground that it was not a spontaneous, you know, movement, but a state-sponsored kind of an operation. Even though I would like to mention here that, as mentioned earlier, the Maoists first came in 1980. I mean, that time they were called Naxalites. Around 1989-90, the first dissent happened against the Maoists. That was by the Congress and the CPI. And that was a completely unarmed uh, dissent. But it petered out because of inner conflicts between the Congress and the CPI. And in the next 10 years, each leader was killed by the Naxalites. So that was the first evidence of some dissent against Naxalite politics in that region. The second largest thing that started was the Sarvajudum. Now Sarvajudum also started initially with some local dissent, but it was too local. I mean it was about like a truck, a CRPF truck which was carrying food grains was intercepted by some Naxalites and the gra grain was taken, looted. So the police later came and they, you know, they picked up people from the nearby village. So the villagers said that, why are you taking our boys because our children were not involved. So then the police said that if they were not involved, then you produce who was involved. So the people felt that for underground actions, often we pay the price. So they called the Naxalite leader of that area. They had a meeting with them. And one of them, one person, Raju his name was, they, you know, uh, overpowered him and handed him to the police. So actually this and a few other similar small incidents happened. But they were too small and they would have petered out. But around this time what happened is that the state government as well as the central government, they took advantage of this in some ways and they converted it into a counter-insurgency, major counter-insurgency operation, which I'm sure you all have heard of, and which led, which, which actually in defense literature, they tried out something which in India has been tried earlier in Nagaland in 1957 and in Mizoram in the 1960s. This is called strategic hamleting. Internationally, it's been done by the uh, US, you know, in Vietnam, by the UK in Malaysia, by some other imperial powers in Africa. But all that was to extend their imperi imperial powers. But it is interesting that within a democracy, a democracy can also resort to these means. So this is called strategic hamleting, which basically means that this whole thing of fish and water, that the fish reside in the water. So if you drain the water, the fish cannot survive. So their idea is to go, you know, they went into village after village in large numbers, you know, 300, 400 people, police, paramilitary, local civ armed civilians, and they basically plundered, looted, destroyed, burnt, uh, you know, if they, found somebody, they often, you know, killed. Uh, there were rapes that time. So there was a big kind of a, that kind of a terror campaign unleashed. 
And in this, we have brought the paramilitary, as I said, from Nagaland. You know, in the first two years, it was the Indian Reserve Battalion from Nagaland. And which is also very ironic, because the Na Na Naga people have themselves suffered at the hands of the Indian state in a similar way, you see. But this is what is memory, you know, you forget in some ways. So the, you know, and the both, again, Nagas and Mizos. And the other irony was that both of them are tribals. So the face of repression there was a tribal face, you know. So, so in any case, there was this whole phase of where, you know, large sections of people in village after village were made to either come to the camps which were on roadside or they ran away to the jungles or they ran away across the border. At the time, this is, I'm speaking about 2005, 2006, 2007, around that time this was thought of as the single largest displacement, you know, that was happening. More than one lakh people, it was said, were displaced. Now the tragedy is that, and this is what against, you know, you can judge Indian democracy through this. When you see that those who are forced to cross the border, you find that they were going from one fifth schedule area to another fifth schedule area. They left at the point where their houses are being burnt. You know, they are looking literally, you know, they were fleeing in a situation when their houses are being burnt, with everything inside burnt. Many of them walked for three days to reach the border and cross the borders. And such people in a fifth schedule area, when they build a hut, the forest department comes and destroys it. They build it again, again it is destroyed. I remember in one village called Sarvela when I went, there was this woman who was sitting with her hands like this because her hut had been destroyed and the police was right there that time when it's this destruction was happening. So 13 or 14 times it had been destroyed. While in the same border area, these people used to go and work in the Mirchi parties, that is Mirchi fields in Khamam. And if you ask who the owners of the Mirchi fields were, you know, they were non-tribals from Guntur or some other part of, you know, Vaisak or nearby Godavari and so on. And uh, they had, not only did they own fields, they owned, owned uh, houses, even though there are laws in uh, Andhra, Andhra Telangana also, one by 70 Act is there, very clearly it states that non-tribals cannot own land in fifth schedule area. So this again, you know, shows us how democracy can be circumvented. So in any case, those were very difficult times. Welfare was completely withdrawn from the inside villages and they were all restricted to the camps. Schools were often the only thing that was there in any case in the interior region which were also demolished or destroyed also by the Maoists because they did not want the paramilitary to go inside and shelter there. So many, even today you go, you find, you know, destroyed schools there.